Okay, we're back with part two of our atomic theory discussion. We had just ta finished talking about John Dalton and his atomic theory, his billiard ball model of the atom. And he did, uh, he believed that uh, once you got to the atom, you couldn't get to anything smaller, an atom was indivisible. We're about to debunk that just a little bit. Um, in 1897, jo Joseph John Thompson, he's known as J.J. Thompson, um, performed some experiments with something called the cathode ray tube. So experiments by several scientists in the late 19th century led to the conclusion that an atom is made up of even smaller particles. J.J. Thompson did some skillful research on cathode rays and I want you to check out a demonstration that I do for you. Um, once again just search my YouTube channel and look for the cathode ray tube demonstration and it's a nice little presentation showing a cathode ray and how J.J. Uh, Thompson discovered the first subatomic particle, and that subatomic particle is known as an electron. Um, it's negatively charged, and it weighs about 2,000 times less than a hydrogen atom. And in this uh, video, we discuss why that was significant, and that was because the hydrogen atom at that time was the smallest known atom. And if you have something 2,000 times smaller than the smallest atom, you have something that's subatomic. So once again, um, um, before you wrap up today, search my YouTube channel for the cathode ray tube demonstration, and watch that carefully. It's just a, just a few minutes long. It won't add too much to your, to your schedule, I hope, for the evening. All right, uh, 1909, uh, Robert Millikan, he's discussed in your textbook. We're not going to spend too much time with him, but he obtained the first accurate measurement of an electron's charge. With this, the mass of an electron was found to be, well, 1 1837th, <laughs> the mass of the lightest known element, hydrogen. So, as J.J. Thompson proposed, about 2,000 times smaller. This obviously has at least four significant figures in it, doesn't it? All right, J.J. Thompson again. A second subatomic particle was discovered. He found that these particles have the same amount of electric charge as an electron. However, the charge is opposite in sign to that of an electron. These particles, of course, are called protons. Thompson calculated the mass of these protons to be about 1,836 times that of an electron or approximately the same size as a hydrogen atom. So protons are much, much larger than electrons. However, they carry the same charge. Now, he envisioned these electrons being embedded in a positive field of these protons. And so the, these spheres here and Thompson's model of the atom represent electrons, and the sphere itself is made up of positive charges distributed out throughout that sphere, and those positive charges, are, of course, are my protons. This model of the atom uh, became known as Thompson's plum pudding model of the atom. Now, here in America, we don't know what plum pudding is, but in Great Britain, apparently it's a common dessert. So I found a picture of it for you on the intranet, and you can see uh, why it got that nickname. We have a pudding, which is a cake-like substance, that appears to be quite moist, with plums um, inside that pudding mixture. So that's what Thompson's model of the atom was. The protons and electrons were encased within the same sphere. Then, Ernest Rutherford came around. He happened to be a student of J.J. Thompson. Um, he also had himself two students, Hans Geiger and Ernest Marston. What they did is they subjected a very thin sheet of gold foil to a stream of positively charged subatomic particles. These are known as alpha particles. They found that most of the particles passed right through the sheet. From this, Rutherford concluded that the atom must consist mainly of empty space. Now we're going to have a little discussion about this experiment because it deserves it. It's, it's fairly important uh, as far as the atomic theory is concerned, but Rutherford proposed that an atom consists primarily of nothing, of empty space. Rutherford was surprised 
that a few of the alpha particles were deflected at such uh, large angles um, when they hit the gold foil. He expected them all to go straight through. Some even bounced back in the opposite direction from which they started. Rutherford was so surprised by this that he is quoted as saying that he was as surprised as if it were a cannonball being deflected by a piece of tissue paper. Rutherford later concluded that this must have been the result of a small core of a positive charge, a very dense, tiny core of positive charge. This is now called the nucleus. So Rutherford believed that the positive charge was concentrated in a very small, tiny, dense center. All of those protons that J.J. Thompson talked about were concentrated in the center of the atom, and outside of that atom was surrounded by the electrons. Let me give you this illustration, or show you this illustration of the Rutherford um, gold foil experiment. Um, this was a lead block, and there was a hole drilled in this lead block, and a source of alpha particles were placed inside this lead block. Now we know alpha particles, um, let's see, I'm going to give you this notation even though you don't know what it is yet. Um, this is the symbolism for an alpha particle, either of these. It's the nucleus of a helium atom, so two protons and two neutrons stripped of its electrons. So it has a positive charge. Okay, And as those particles were directed at this thin film of gold foil, Rutherford expected them to go right through. Now this screen here is made out of zinc sulfide. And in complete darkness, when ionizing radiation in the form of, let's say, alpha particles strikes the zinc sulfide screen, it will fluoresce. It will glow a little bit. So Rutherford had his assistants, Hans Geiger and Ernest Marston, in a photographic dark room staring through a microscope at this zinc sulfide screen, counting the number of dots that would show up as these alpha particles were shot through the gold foil. Almost all of them went straight through. However, they noticed his assistants that a few were deflected at strange angles, and so they got Dr. Rutherford into the photographic darkroom, and they said, hey, something strange is going on here, and he witnessed that, sure enough, some of the particles were deflected at rather large angles, and so he proposed that they turn their viewing uh, area around to the back side of the zinc sulfide screen, and sure enough, every once in a while, not very often, some of the particles would actually be deflected back towards them. And Rutherford could not explain this. It took him a considerable uh, amount of time as far as thinking is concerned and flat out courage to be able to publish what he thought. This is what he thought. So, if we have the nucleus of an atom, or the protons, excuse me, of an atom concentrated in the center of the atom, a very, very small volume, and the electrons buzzing around the outside, these alpha particles that were shot towards the gold foil, most of them would go straight through and they wouldn't even come close to the nucleus of an atom. However, those that came close to the nucleus of the atom would be a positive charged alpha particle interacting with a positively charged nucleus. We all know that like charges repel and they would be deflected. What happens if they hit the nucleus head on? Well, then they would be deflected back towards the source. Now, since this happened so rarely, Rutherford proposed that the distance between these nuclei is nowhere near as close as it's illustrated in this uh, image here. What he proposed was if the nucleus of the atom was the size of this uh, small sphere here, the size of a child's marble, the closest electron would be about two miles away. So if we made the nucleus this big, the closest electron would be two miles away. Well, how far would that put the closest atom? Well, even farther away. So what's between this nucleus and its closest neighbor? Well, sure, you have some electrons, but remember how tiny they are and how spread out they are. The substance or the stuff, if you want to call it, between this nucleus and the neighboring nucleus is a whole lot of nothingness, empty space. So Rutherford proposed that matter is composed primarily of empty space. Now you think about that the next time you decide to punch the wall in frustration, uh, that you're not understanding your chemistry, uh, you would hope that that wall and your fist were made out of empty space. Think about perhaps why 
your fist is stopped by that wall. So the Rutherford model of the atom is sort of like a planetary model of the atom. We have the nucleus in the center and it's positively charged and it's surrounded by orbiting electrons which have a negative charge. So the negative charge is literally separated from the positively charged nucleus. Now about 20 years later, James Chadwick came on the scene and it was postulated that a third subatomic particle existed, but these were very difficult to find. 1932, if you think about it, relatively speaking, was not that long ago. In fact, he's the first guy that we've seen who dresses somewhat in a modern fashion, don't you think? He found high energy particles with no charge and essentially the same mass as a proton. So about the same weight as a proton, but they didn't have a charge this time. These particles are known as neutrons. By the way, neutrons and protons are now known to be made up of even smaller particles. We won't even begin that discussion. All we'll worry about in this class are the subatomic particles uh, that are protons and it's symbolized with a P with a plus sign, neutrons, N with a superscript naught or zero, and electrons, E with a negative sign. Those are the only subatomic particles we will concern ourselves with in first year chemistry. Do not worry about what protons, neutrons, and electrons might be made up of. Okay. I wanted to wrap up there for today. So this one's sort of a short video. Um, we're going to talk about isotopes next time, and I want to spend some time talking about what an isotope is and how we calculate something called average atomic mass. I also want to talk about isotopic notation. And when you see symbolism on the periodic table or in other places, I want you to be able to understand what those symbols and numbers represent. So we're going to call it a day. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Stay tuned. Part 3 will be coming up soon. Bye-bye.